guys. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we are recording. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is a call to talk about the gas API uh, and, and how 1559 affects it. Um, if we have time, we can cover any other questions, concerns that, that folks here have. Um, so Trent already shared the agenda in, in the in the in the chat here. Um, basically, uh, the main I think topic, or I, yeah. The main topic of discussion today is, you know, what do we do to return the priority fee in the JSON RPC API? There was already some discussion about that uh, on the issue. And um, before that, though, uh, I think Trent, you put in the agenda the presentation by gas API providers. So I don't know if there's folks here who've actually, you know, prototyped or, or looked at what, uh, you know, like a gas price oracle can look like post 1559, but if anybody wants to uh, sh share that, uh, it's usually pretty helpful to just start off with looking at something, otherwise we can go right into the, the API. Yeah, I see uh, um, there's some Etherscan people here, or if anybody else wants to just jump in, go ahead. Whoever was just speaking, feel free to just speak. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm from the GET team, and well, I can I can I can talk about what we have as a guest price oracle now. If someone's not familiar with or, that already, or does that uh, does already everyone know that? Or should I, I think it, it it would be pretty bad. Like it was at least valuable for me yesterday and the day before to understand it better. So yeah, I think walking through what you have now and how it's changing under fifteen fifty nine. I know that like you and Peter posted some some comments as well, but yeah, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, so, okay, I won't go into like very fine details, but it's pretty simple actually. So uh, what we had for a very long time, like for regular transactions was uh, that basically we took the past, uh, I don't know how many blocks, well, actually it depended on whether you were running a full node or a light node, because if you were a full node, uh, the gas price oracle took the last 20 blocks, so it's quite a lot. But if you were running a light client, then maybe two, and maybe now the latter will be better. But, uh, and what it did is uh, it took uh, the few smallest uh, gas price transactions and basically uh, found the, not the median, but uh, slightly below that. So if uh, we put them in descending order, there may be, I think, 60th percentile or something like that, and just return that as a, as a suggestion. And uh, and yeah, so what uh, we current we are currently planning, at least the latest like kind of team consensus is uh, that we are going to keep this mechanism and. Uh, use it for, uh, I mean, we feed the effective minor reverse uh, into it. So, so that's what uh, it will actually uh, use. And, uh, and this will be a suggestion for the tip, for the, the priority, max priority fee. And uh, for the fee cap, for the, for the max fee per gas, uh, we suggest this uh, tip plus uh, twice the current uh, base fee. And uh, yeah, uh, it's still a good question how many blocks we should take and, uh, and uh, it might depend on certain situations. So I also had this proposal that I just posted like this morning that maybe we could just um, so it might depend on whether there's a congestion right now or not. So we could we could like iterate through the recent blocks and uh, and like offer different uh, uh, priority fees depending on how urgent it is for you. And maybe this could be also like a nice uh, signal for to for the users to see if there's a congestion or not. Uh, I can dig up the link and but I, it's 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 in the in the fifteen fifty nine fee market uh, dev channel. So yeah. And, but basically we are going to, uh, so this is what we want to do. We want to just uh, use this, uh, this take, take, take the minimum or close to minimum uh, uh, tips of, of, of recent blocks and uh, offer something below the median. And yeah, so that's what we want.
Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, so, and yeah, again, on the, on the issue, I think the main concern about the current GET implementation is if, um, if there's a spike in usage, uh, those will likely be short lived. And yeah, the 20 block is almost uh, remembering like too much, like looking at too much history. Whereas under 1559, um, you know, things will probably happen much quicker. Like if there's a spike, it's likely that it's going to be something on the order of less than 10 blocks. And, um, and if you're looking back at 20, you might have users overpace likely. Um, mm. I'm not so sure about that. Actually, if there's a spike, the spike is short-lived. So yeah. if you if you take the recent block, so if you like accommodate yourself to the spike, then you will pay a lot and get in earlier. And if you take longer the longer history, then uh, you will find a tip that has worked like in the past usually. And then what will happen is that you will wait out like the uh, spike and uh, and get in somewhere at the descending uh, edge of the spike. So I'm, I'm not sure. Interesting. Doesn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it depends on what you want, how urgent you yeah. want to get in your transaction. Yeah. Yeah. So basically this, if I'm understanding correctly, the API would work kind of pretty well. Obviously, if there's no spike at all, like if, if uh, the blocks are pretty constant, it would also work pretty well if there has been a spike in the last 20 blocks, but it's kind of over and it would it would probably fail in, you know, there is a spike happening right now. And, you know, um, yeah, then that, that means you send your transaction and it just kind of has to wait until the spike is cleared to be, to be included again. Is that roughly right? Um, well, yeah, uh, if we use like a constant setting, then I mean, a constant setting for how many blocks we look back, then yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for linking my proposal. So I think, I think that kind of, addresses this but uh, yeah so this is just like putting up ideas right now but okay so that's what we have now yes yeah. got it uh micah your your hand is up so i just want to reiterate my broken net recordness um so most people here probably already know what i'm going to say but i'm going to say it again for the new audience um, i'm generally against um any sort of priority fee estimation that's not just what do we believe the miners min value is uh, the reason for this is because it's kind of self-reinforcing, getting people into these auction and bidding wars. And in most cases, it's probably unnecessary. And in the cases that are remaining, uh, it often can just hurt the user as much as it helps them. And so I think it's much better that most of our oracles we're writing, unless we're writing oracles specifically for like uh, very advanced users, like you know bot authors and stuff like that, which I don't think any of us are. I really think that for the premium, we should just be saying, hey, we know that miners will accept a premium of one or two or three or whatever. And that's unlikely to be changing. And so this is what you need to set the premium to, and that's it. Like, I do not think we should be incentivizing or incentivizing, encouraging and helping people get into these gas auctions because they're just, they're going to get it themselves hurt. Like things are going to go wrong. Like it's just for the end user, it doesn't, I don't think it really improves anything in a significant way. And um, it's a lot of work and a lot of complexity, and then we have to expose this in UIs, and it's just it's just a huge headache that I really don't think is going to help us down the road. Yeah, I kind of agree, but what? So, uh, so this is so t this is why I'm saying that sometimes it it makes sense to look like uh, more into the past and okay, this is like the minimum that has ever worked and suggest that. But I mean, so you you are talking about using a constant basically, and ether price is changing, so basically. Uh, I don't know, minor preferences, the technology, a lot of things can change. So these, if these minor settings do change, how will users notice that if we don't look for the facts like how, like, like, like the actually included transactions? Uh, yeah, so I think the, we, we do need to have it be dynamic, um, but that dynamicism should be over like really long time scales. Like we don't, I don't, yeah. I want to be cautious here because it is possible that there is a little bit of incentive for miners to actually have dynamic base fee or sorry, dynamic premium or priority fee pricing based on current MEV rewards. Um, this is really complex, really hard to do, but it is possible and theoretically rational. Uh, so I want to be cautious with my words here, but at the same time, I also think that it's probably unlikely we're going to see miners do this anytime soon because it's a lot of work and it, the games are pretty minor compared to the other engineering tasks they could be doing. 
And so I think that we can look kind of longitudinally and say, you know, the clients that are out there, like Geth, that miners, we think miners are using, have just like a command line option for set your minimum priority fee. And we believe most miners are just setting a minimum to something. And we have seen, you know, over the last 10,000 blocks, 95% of the miners have been below two. And so, or have mined a block with a transaction below two. So set your base fee or set your priority fee to two. And I want to be careful to not get into this, not trying to be too dynamic, not trying to adjust hyper fast to what we think miners might be changing. Because most of the time when that changes, it's just due to a very short term congestion spike and it does not last. And so I, I do think it should be dynamic. We shouldn't just hard. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I want to be careful of too much. Yeah. Can I go next? Yes, um, yeah, go ahead. Right, so I do think also the value probably needs to be dynamic, but the issue with looking at, let's say, past uh, records of what people have been bidding is that we might be too slow to actually catch that the spikes are happening, in which case, while the spike, spike is happening, you're still recommending the minimum tip to users. And at the end, when the spike is over, you, your indicator will still be kind of trailing these high values um, and, and it might not be that useful. But we do have an objective source uh, that we get for free uh, from 1559 itself. Like we don't need to look at what users are doing. We can simply look at how full the blocks are or maybe like the two or three uh, recent blocks. And if we see that two or three blocks in, a, in, in, in sequence or even the previous block uh, was full, then we know that we are in one of these uh, spike uh, regimes. And, and we don't need to wait to see users increasing their tips because they might not do that first by themselves. They might rely on wallets, which would do that for them. And, and second, even if we wait for this, with the parameters that are set, looking back 20 blocks and looking at the percentile, it's not clear that you would catch immediately that the spike is happening. And you can really do get it um, quickly enough by looking at the at the gas usage in the block itself. So I I would this is kind of what I was advocating for, and I understand that it might be very different from the current paradigm. And then uh, there's a bit more implementation complexity, but but this is where I stand on the API. So do you so do you suggest that we should uh, uh, react uh, quickly to the spikes uh, with the recommendations in the end? Well, I think if you're going to react at all, so Mika recommends not reacting at all. And, and that's definitely a valuable position. But I do think that it, it might be valuable for users to have at least some kind of indication that something is going on. Mm -hmm. So if you do want this indication, I, I, I think uh, relying on the gas used by the previous block or the previous two or three blocks would be more accurate than relying on more subjective uh, price points such as what the users are currently doing yeah well yeah so that is why i propose that we should like return uh, a series of suggestions de depending on how urgent it is and yeah so the users could decide whether they want to like uh, uh, fight uh, fight 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 for for, for 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 priority or not and uh, yeah it's also good to see whether there's actually have something happening right now but yeah uh, always suggesting like to 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 jump on the spikes. I I don't think that's a good good idea. Offering it in, as as an option that that might be good. Right. I think returning series of prices like options it might be okay. But but I would still use the the gas used as as a as a metric to to check that something is happening that rather than user prices because then you will have like this kind of uh, self reinforcing behavior. But I think Mika is, is worried about and, and so am I. So, yeah. Uh, Mika? Uh, yeah, so just to reinforce what Barnaby says, if we are going to do uh, reactive gas pricing to congestion, we sh should definitely use the fullness of previous blocks to identify congestion. Similarly, when we're trying to determine what like the, the 95th percentile minimum is, if we decide to go with that, we should use that same uh, block fullness to filter out um, minimums. So like if we're trying to figure out, okay, what, what do we think 95% of miners have set their min to? We should first filter out any blocks that were, were full or sorry, 
any blocks, yeah, so any blocks are full, filter those out and don't count them at all um, to get those numbers. So that way we are seeing just the minimums. We're not seeing the congestion times. Um, separately, the thing to keep in mind, I think, with this debate of should we be reactive or not, is that if everyone is reactive, it turns into a pathological scenario where kind of everyone ends up paying more. Like the, the reactiveness is useful as an, as an advantage over competition. And so if you have one user competing against another user, the one that reacts wins. If you are building an ecosystem, all your users presumably are you know, approximately equal, like you want to serve them all. In which case, if you build in tooling for everybody competing using the same strategy, you just end up paying miners unnecessarily. And so if we do introduce these strategies kind of at a very core layer, like in Geth, for example, we need to make sure that they're introduced in a way that most people don't use them. Like, I know it sounds weird to introduce a feature that we don't want people to use, but if we introduce them in a way that everybody uses them, then they become un not useful anymore. Like they no longer serve a purpose. We, we very much need to introduce this. And one way to achieve that is by having like this concept of transaction priority, like kind of fast, medium, slow or whatever, where the fast is saying, yes, I want to be reactive. And the slow is saying, no, I don't want to react. Um, one caveat with that though, is that I'm worried that compared to the base fee, you know, if the base fee is a hundred and the fast, medium, slow is like two, one, two, and three, like everybody will always choose fast. And now we're back in that same situation where everybody is choosing fast, at which point it is no longer helping anybody because everybody's following the same strategy. Like in order for this to work, we need people to be following different strategies. If everybody follows the same strategy, the strategy stops working. Um, this is very common in game theory. And so just keep that in mind that we, we need ways to make sure people are not following the same strategy. So one question I wanted to ask is a, a bit tangential to the discussion is that uh, we're kind of trying to solve the whole gas price suggestion uh, problem before we actually see how the network behaves. And uh, so my personal two cents would be that uh, so the current model at least that get, get implemented is, is essentially just continuing the old algorithm. And I, I completely agree that this might be completely unsuitable for certain tasks or certain scenarios, but it kind of worked until now. So wouldn't it be kind of prudent to wait until mainnet actually forks over and see how the base fee fluctuates and how tips fluctuate before we try to solve this problem? So I'm kind of, uh, the only thing I'm afraid of is that we're coming up with a solution to the wrong problem because we don't know what the problem is until the fork. Yeah, well, yeah, but the problem I might depend on what we offer as a default option. So yeah, <laughs> it's the, I, I kind of agree with you, but yeah, we should also keep in mind that what we will see in practice, that depends on what we offer as a default option now. Yeah. Yeah, of course. But uh, essentially, if we continue our current algorithm, then uh, at least we know how wrong it is. Whereas, for example, Micah had a really nice example. That if the base fee is uh, 100 and the tips are one, two, and three, then it doesn't really matter. And this is exactly the problem. We don't know how the tip will fluctuate in comparison with the base fee. So that's why I'm saying it's not super easy to, to solve the problem. At least for me, it's not super clear what the exact problem is or will be. Uh, I thought greg you had a comment and i think you put your hand down yeah i mean for me it was just kind of I was just coming back on miko but he kind of answered it. the the big one for me um is that you know i personally i've like personally believe like i would rather people polling the nodes to figure out a gas price than a third-party api um, and in that case, like we're always going to have to be competitive to some degree. So if, you know, you kind of have to go back down to like, there has to be some level of competitiveness there. Um, obviously the issue being naturally that like, we're going to run to the same, same problem we have now where everybody's just competing for astronomically high prices is, is a problem. Um, but in the case where like, you know, we have products that we use, um, if we don't, we try using the node and we actually had to switch off of uh, Geth and open Ethereum just like we couldn't rely on the node for the gas price anymore. And now we're using a third party, which is not what I want to be doing. Right. So like, I think we have to do some sort of competitiveness and like, 
like you said, you just have to be careful, but I kind of do agree with Peter in the sense that, you know, is there something simplistic we can do and just see how it ends up playing out in the real world? So I think there, I think there is a, a simple thing we can do um, that has a good chance of working for launch. And then we can reevaluate once you have more data. And that is to encourage um, the client devs to have a hard-coded default for the priority fee, min priority fee that miners use and a hard-coded default for the uh, priority fee that gets returned if you ask for a gas price recommendation and make sure those two are the same thing. Um, both of them can be overridden by command line parameters or whatever. Um, but the idea here is, is that by default, if all the miners just run stock guess and all the users run stock guess, then everything will just work. Like the min priority fee that miners are accepting is exactly the same as the priority fee that users are using. And everything gets through with an exception for during congestion, at which point we get good data on how congestion happens and what goes on there. And then like a week or two later, we can start making alternative recommendations. And then the next patch of guess can maybe include some, something more smart. Um, but if we can get all the clients to kind of just agree that, hey, we're, our miners will do this at, by default as the min and our, um, users will get this as the min, then I think we have something that can work out of the gate. And my guess is, is that most miners are probably gonna run stock geth out of the gate and similarly watch and see before they crank up their numbers. Um, so we can set that to one, we can set that to two, maybe we set it to five, you know, we believe that, you know, one or two is probably the right number. Maybe we set it to five just because around launch that will probably be inconsequential compared to the base fee anyways. And so, um, you know, people won't mind five and it, means that it's less likely that miners are going to manually adjust that. Um, again, that requires all the clients kind of agreeing. We're kind of agreeing, hey, this is our launch number just to feel things out. Um, but I think it's really simple and it gets us to a point where we have more data. So a counter argument to that would be that uh, currently the gas prices fluctuate. I mean, I have no idea what it is currently. Last a couple of days ago, it was around 30. A week before that, it was around 100. So you have a quite large fluctuation with me, which means that the node has to fluctuate along with the gas price. Otherwise, your, the transaction you make will never get included. Oh, I see. It, you're, you're saying the issue here is the, for specifically for the, the ETH underscore gas price needs to work for legacy transactions, not just... Um... Uh, no, I'm, I'm talking about in general, both. That one, if, I, if you want to submit a transaction by a gas, then your assumption is that the transaction will go through reasonably fast. Now, if um, if GAT will always tell you that the tip is two gigaway and the base fee is whatever, then probably when others are paying a hundred gigaway for the tip, I mean, good luck with your two gigaway. Yeah, and I think so, so. This is yeah the failure mode of hard, basically hard coding the base fee works only when there's not a spike, right? So what you're the trade-off you're saying there is like you won't you're guaranteed to like not overpay when there's not a spike but if there is a spike you'll be way underpriced and then you need some other way to to estimate what the right base uh, what the right uh, priority fee is um yeah. yeah exactly and the caveat there is that we expect spikes to be both rare and short-lived and so for users that are just using the default they will probably still get through like as long as you're setting like base fee times two or whatever, like this is common when people talk about, um, you'll probably get through in almost all cases. Like it just might take you until at the end of the spike and the spikes yeah. like, you know, seven blocks or whatever. And so not just the spikes, later, you'll get in. Yeah, there's, there's two cases where you won't get in. It's uh, one, if there's a spike and two, if there's a high value MEV transaction. And this is why setting a constant is a bit harder. Uh, Barnabé has uh, made some, some, some graphs about this, but uh, basically if, you know, if a block has uh, a really high MEV transaction, uh, the opportunity cost of being uncalled is, is quite high. So it's it's kind of unlikely to include anything with this kind of hard-coded tip. Um, so I think when when I last looked last week, you know, if you get if you hard code a tip of two, then it's I think it gets you something like 75% of the blocks with MEV. It, it still makes sense to include those transactions. Uh, if you if you have a tip of, and, and the top 25% probably just won't include transactions with low tip. Um, so that's the other case where you're just kind of selling it out. I think right now, 
Um, last time I checked, there's about 35, 40% of blocks that have MEV. So that means, you know, statistically, like if you're really unlucky, you send your transaction, the block has a ton of MEV in it. Um, but then, you know, the block after probably doesn't have a ton and, and you get into that block. Um, but yeah, it is a case where like, um, and I don't think the current gas price Oracle can really pick it up. Like it'll probably pick up, um, you know, what's the sort of average, long run average and, and, you know, looking at it right now, it would be like two GUI would compensate for the uncle risk, uh, accounting for like something like the 75th percentile of MEV. Um, but you're, yeah, you're not going to be included in those blocks where there's like a 10 ETH uh, front running opportunity. Yeah, with the, again, the cat, my caveat here is that we, we should do this as a launch thing with plans to change it in the future. Um, and the reason I think this is fine is because. I think you just broke are up. going to all of a sudden have. <laughs> we missed, uh, we missed the reason you think this is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now or am I still bad? You're good. Okay, so the reason I think this is fine is because on launch day, I find it very unlikely that all the miners are going to all of a sudden have super advanced pricing, gas uh, min pricing strategies already coded into a patch for GEF or whatever miner they're running, um, even without having any data on 1559, just like us. Like, remember, miners are going through this exact same process as we are, where they have no data, they have no idea how things are going to work out in the wild they don't have the geth code to work on yet so they can't even start their patch until after we get our release candidates out and so like if we just plan on having this like this is our kind of launch thing to get to gain more data and we you know in a couple of weeks we'll change it or in a month we'll change it i think that's safe like i don't think we have to worry too much about like a large percentage of miners having hyper advanced gas pricing strategies on launch day um so I, I, I wanted to bring up a point, which is like on launch day, on the day of the fork, most people, most clients who are sending transactions are probably going to continue sending legacy transactions um, until like the market is stabilized or they'll gradually roll it out or something. And those folks are going to, you know, many of them still rely on the ETH gas price API. And assuming that still exists and, you know, at least is backwards compatible and continues to return um, the same implementation for legacy transactions, that means that folks are essentially going to be, like the majority of the market is going to be sending legacy transactions with max fee set to, and max fee and max priority fee set to the same thing, which I believe means that the majority, like unless we are committed to like breaking ETH gas price and getting rid of that API altogether, we are de facto, like clients, you know, Geth is gonna be de facto making pricing recommendations anyways. Is that correct? Yes, well, that's correct. Almost. So it doesn't really matter what you have the ETH, ETH gas price or ETH not gas price uh, standpoint, because legacy transactions still only have one gas price field, and which gets interpreted as both the tip and the, I mean, I said both fees. So as long as you're sending a legacy transaction, it doesn't matter how you estimate the gas price, it's still going to burn a lot. Right. I guess uh, what I'm say, saying is. I guess it yeah, I what, think I see what the difference is... here. Just to... Oh, go, go ahead, Mike. So I think I see the difference here. Um, I think Peter is talking about people who send their transactions unsigned to Geth, and then Geth fills them in and signs them and submits them. And I think Yuga and other people are talking about people who ask Geth for the gas price, and then they fill out their own transaction in a script or an external service, sign it, and then give that to Geth to submit to the chain. Yeah, I was talking about that second thing. So if you just ask a guest to sign a transaction, we will never sign a legacy transaction. So guest will always be false to 1559 transaction. Uh, I'm uh, so referring to the ETH gas price when you when you sign when you sign it outside of guest, so to say, you just you just ask for the gas price and create a legacy transaction yourself. In that case, I mean the, both the tip and the fee will be the same. I think that wasn't that the initial problem is everybody will be using the old legacy transaction. So maybe I don't understand what, what do you, will the return value of ETH underscore gas price change with the fork? It will be the same as before. Just a single value, right? Like a single number. 
And that single number will be a combination of base fee times two or whatever, plus some priority fee recommendation. Mm, priority, so it will be the priority fee plus one base fee. Okay, so, so, so it'll be priority fee. So essentially that would be repaying the current behavior. People who want to sign a non-legacy transaction would probably want to use a new endpoint that gets uh, base fee separately and priority fee separately. Yes, for that uh, we did in, so there was, I think last client made the, uh, the PR to the something spec EIP, whatever, about the URPC endpoint. So yes, we did introduce that. So we do have the, uh, I don't know what it's called, whatever it is in the EIP, it's called that endpoint to actually return just the tip. And then uh, okay. we have a separate endpoint. So if you want to submit uh, between 59 transactions, you do have a separate endpoint to specifically give you a tip. And uh, we do not have an endpoint to give you a fee cap because if so, if you don't specify to adjust the default to the tip plus two base fees, if you want more control, you can specify it is fairly reliable. So the, the hard thing okay. to do is estimate the tip. So that's that's why we do support an API for that. Okay, gotcha. Got right, that clears things up for me. Thank you. Uh, Yuga, I'm sorry for interrupting. I was wrong. No, no, no worries at all. I mean, I guess the only point I'm making is basically it's clear that um, clients are like ETH clients are going to make recommendations. There's no way around that, right? Because there are many, many people who rely on these APIs, on the ETH gas price API specifically. So we are, you know, the community is de facto making a recommendation about how to price 1559 transactions because, you know, legacy transactions can be interpreted. Uh, as 1559 transactions. So like that ship has essentially sailed, I think. So the only question is, what is the type of recommendation we make? Well, yeah, but that, um, again, you made a nice point there. That the problem here is that we don't just buy this switch over to 1559, rather we will have a mix and match uh, for the, what's more initially, most of the transactions will keep being legacy transactions. So, People have an expectation of how legacy transactions work, how they are priced, how they compete with them. So I don't think we can really break that expectation. And then if you have a network with 90% legacy transactions, then you need to create your 1559 transactions in a way that they can actually compete with the legacy transactions. Because if the legacy transactions are paying 10x the tip, then it doesn't matter how nice algorithm you come up with for the 1559 transactions, they won't get included because they were just always on the price compared to the legacy transactions. So this was kind of my, where I was coming at is that I don't think it's advisable to break the current workflow for legacy transactions because we have projects, wallets and everything that kind of rely on it with all its quirks and uglinesses and some optimality. So I don't think it's advisable to break that. And if we don't want to break that, then our hands are kind of limited into how we can implement uh, estimations for 1559. But this is the problem, I don't have a solution. <laughs> So I guess one thing uh, I'd be curious to hear kind of people's thoughts on is, Greg, you kind of mentioned earlier, you know, you see it as like a bad thing to query like a third party service to get more precise gas price estimates. Um, at the same time, it kind of feels like a separation of concern issues, like where, you know, guess, guess like main functionality is not to be like a gas rights oracle, right? It's to be a node and to submit some, you know, reasonable estimate for the gas price. Um, and, and it does feel like, you know, 1559 has like a much broader design space for like gas price oracles. So I, I don't know, I'm curious like what, what people feel, you know, like if Geth has like this good enough kind of backwards compatible solution that's like not optimal in all cases, you know, does it make sense to have folks like ETH gas station, gas now and whatnot be the ones who kind of, you know, come up with like fancier APIs that do look at the block history that that do help with this use case. Like, 
I, I guess, I don't know, more granular if, if you want like use cases. Um, I don't know if people have thoughts on that. Rick, I see your hand is up. Hi, hi. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me personally, I feel like Geth is the best place to put an Oracle because everything already kind of needs it. And I mean, it itself needs it, but it's like a point I can kind of trust. If a person's trusting Inferior, they're going to continue trusting Inferior. It's weird that, you know, in order to do anything, I have to trust Inferior and now some like a get gas price, something, something. Um, especially when all the data is sitting in memory in Geth, it has to for other purposes anyways. Um, and so that's kind of my hope is that, uh, I mean, at some point I, I saw somebody else recommend it as well as even like a histogram or something of, of gas prices. But it seems like there should be some way to like bubble up information in a call that that can be used by a, a more clever Oracle. Um, even if, if Geth doesn't want to be the final call, if they can bubble up enough information that's sitting there literally in memory, it doesn't have to hit the, hit the disk or anything um, in my mind. Uh, so that's kind of my take on that. Uh, like in ethers, when you connect to something, you connect to something. If you call get gas price, it's not going to start then trusting some, some other service um, for the gas price. So that's my two cents. Got it. Uh, Santiago, I see your hand is up as well. Yeah, I agree with Rick in that it would be great if Geth could solve 95% of the cases. And we were mentioning that we still haven't figured out exactly how to solve the difficult cases like the bot writers or the traders or people who need to get in during a spike. I think that would be the place where we would rely on gas now, on ETH gas station or more complex gas, um, gas price oracles. But for the average user, I would love if Geth can provide the, the whole solution. Uh, Peter, I see your hand it up again. Yeah, so uh, an interesting question from, from Geth's perspective is um, essentially currently Geth provides one API endpoint. Now, um, given that 1559 will arrive, let's say we will have two API endpoints, one for lengthy transactions and one for 1559 transactions. Now, our assumption up until this point is that Geth is kind of work operates in this headless mode where an external app just tells Geth to submit this transaction and then Geth needs to figure it out. Now, from this perspective, uh, I don't think we can make it much smarter. Now, uh, I think it was Joe's suggestion to maybe have an additional API endpoint, uh, maybe I'm adding the additional part, that may be able to provide some more information. But the problem is that it, Yes, maybe we could be smarter and look at uh, various metrics and try to give some options to the user. But uh, for such an API, essentially, um, you need something in front of Geth that can actually show this to the user or make heads or tails of the recommendations or the variation. And then the user or something gets to pick. But I still think that uh, if you just have a dumb program like uh, uh, mining pool payout that just wants to pay the relevance of how much it costs, then you'll be still in the dumb API, which kind of just works and doesn't give any choice. But yeah, I'm completely that's... fine with having an additional API endpoint that tries to be a bit smarter and tries to offer up some suggestions. Yeah, I, I the way I imagine my suggestion, yes. Uh, uh, so this is this is why I think it's a good thing if the like uh, more flexible thing is like a general generalization of the default thing, and we should definitely leave the default uh, default API. And I also want it to work more or less the way it did work before, because yeah, it's better to not break things that already exist. Yeah. Sorry, can we get a confirmation to what uh, Bernabe asked on the chat on what exactly the gas price API would be returning? Is it going to be base fee plus the get estimation of max priority fee? So currently, um, uh, so currently uh, the gas price oracle within GAF um, just looks at the past blocks and try to see what was the minimum uh, 
minimum, I think for each block, what was the minimum three uh, tips actually paid to the miner. And then based on that, it will currently, it currently stakes the 60th percentile. So it essentially tries to uh, take not, not the smallest tips within the blocks, but something very close to the smallest tips. And so yeah, but I think Barnabas' question was that uh, what will the old guess, eight guess price API recommend? Yes, yes, and that's, I think that's what, what I'm getting. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so essentially, I was saying that internally get calculates a recommendation for the fit. And then for the old ETH gas price, we just add the current base fee for that to that tip. And essentially that way, uh, the base fee gets burned and the, the, the tip that the miner uh, gets will be more or less what the miners were getting in the previous blocks. So the miners should be happy with that tip. So yeah, basically the answer to Bernabe's question is yes, it's correct, what he asked. Thank you. Can I ask a follow, quick follow-up on that? Uh, what is going to be GEF behavior if it, if it sees a transaction on the mempool with a base fee that's below the current block? Is it going to keep it on the mempool or is it going to drop it? Currently, the implementation actually was implemented by John. Is that... Uh, okay, you, you can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, it. just real quickly yeah so i don't want to again go into details but uh, yes we do keep uh, if 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 there's uh, so 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 we do do keep uh, transactions in the mempool that are currently not includable if they have a high fee cap because uh, then they will surely become includable really soon so so what we do is that uh, for most of the pool we have this uh, we we recalculate the actual minor re reward based on the current base fee the latest base fee and we prioritize transactions based on that but uh, there's like a little space reserved for those transactions that uh, uh, would like fare very badly in this comparison, but uh, still have a high fee cap or max fee. And therefore they are worth keeping so that, uh, because they will be includable in the next, I don't know, five blocks probably. So yeah. Perfect, thank you. Uh, essentially about uh, uh, previously, so currently GAF uh, transaction pool maintains 4,000 transactions. And with, and with this update that is in 59, we added another 1,000 transactions whose purpose is to be the, those transactions which cannot currently be executed because the base fee overflows or underflows or whatever, but, uh, but otherwise they kind of look good. Uh, but as a disclaimer, it is a new mechanism, so we're hopeful it doesn't blow up in our faces. <laughs> The reason I was asking is because there is the intuition that legacy users who are sending the old format transaction will always be uh, grossly overpaying because they have their uh, max fee equal to the max priority, etc. But actually, if you if your API returns the base fee plus an estimation of the uh, max priority fee, and if the max priority fee of this legacy user is really large, over time, base fee should kind of try and compensate for that. And base fee will, will, will sort of match the, the price levels that these legacy users uh, are sending initially, which means that once that happens, the actual priority fee that these legacy users are sending will, should, should be pretty small and should be once again close to the minimum that miners uh, would accept. And so legacy users are actually a bit um, hampered by this because they are recommended prices which are close to base fee, which means that any small fluctuation upwards of the base fee means they are priced out. It's not like the current mechanism where, okay, there's room they can still go in, like the base fee is really binding. So I don't think we need to, to be too worried about these legacy users. And I don't think we need to have necessarily this image that they will be really overpaying all the time. I'd like to ask a follow-up question to uh, Peter's comment about mempool structure there. Um, currently, the mempool is divided into two parts of the uh, queued and the pending. Um, did I understand correctly that there is now going to be a new component to the mempool that contains these uh, high max fee, but not, um, but the base fee is insufficient for the current block? Uh, 
yeah, uh, so this is a different division. So queued and pending, that's uh, like uh, per account thing, and it's about the ordering of, of uh, like sequential transactions. But uh, so there's there's like a big heap for all the or the, we had one big heap for all the the remote transactions uh, and uh, and yeah so that was so that 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 priority heap was for for like eviction of uh, underpriced very low priced transactions and this is what has changed and uh, this is now that. Uh, works that yes if 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 it uh, falls out from one queue that uh, is based on current minor reward then it still has a chance to stay in the second queue that's based most that, that is just based on fee cap on max fee so yeah and this is this is a new queue and is this additional queue this new queue it, it does that consume additional queue uh, i'm sorry um sort of slots like we have yes. 4,000 now for the yes. pending. So we did not want to break the existing situation. So we raised the, the mempool size slightly. So now we have uh, 4,000 uh, sorted by current minor reward and an extra 1,000 uh, sorted by fee cap, which is, I think, affordable. And, uh, and uh, it's also guaranteed that it will not work any worse than before, at least if the code is not broken or something, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you for the clarification. So one slight clarification that I wanted to make or precision is that, uh, the, so currently um, this, uh, this queue split isn't really a split, isn't really introducing any new queues, rather what it does is it just changes the eviction algorithm. So previously when the queue was full and in the pending, you had 4,000 uh, transactions queued up for execution and another one arrived, then that one actually needed to push something out. And then if there was something cheaper, then it pushed that something cheaper out. And with the new algorithm, uh, we have a combination that if, uh, let's say I have 5,000 transactions because that's the new limit, then if the new transaction pushes something out tick-wise from the 4,000, then it gets included. And if it, if it cannot push something out tick-wise, then it can try to push something out uh, from the worst 1,000 maximum cap wise. So it's just playing around with uh, the eviction rules, but otherwise structurally the transaction pool remains exactly the same. Any more questions on the gas price article? There was one other thing um, on the agenda, so I just want to make we have ten minutes, um, so it feels like a natural transition. But uh, it, I, I do have one other comment. Oh, um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people comment that they want to avoid centralized oracles, um, which I am one hundred percent on board with. I think the thing to keep in mind is that we need to drop our understanding of the old system and think about the new one. In the old system, in order to build an Oracle, you needed to basically monitor the pending pool, have a access to large amounts of data and you know the flow of transactions. It was really complicated. These new Oracle oracles should be mostly implementable as just a JavaScript library. Like it'll be like three functions long and you can just copy and paste it into any piece of code. We can have you know gists that have them, there'll be GitHubs that have them, et cetera. You don't need this high frequency data access. The one exception of that is you do need to know what the base fee is. And so I do think the clients should return the base fee for the next block. And you do need to know um, what that minor estimate is. That, that one is like a, a data problem. And so I do think there's value in, in the clients returning data about that. Once we return those two pieces of data, though, everything else should be calculatable with a small JavaScript library. Like you don't need more data than that like you used to. And so I don't think we need to worry about uh, centralization of oracles like we see with gas now and, and Infura or whatever, um, because the oracle is simplified so much that it fits in a library, as long as we have the data we need from the clients. And so I would much rather see these endpoints in the clients return that data that we need. And this is what Rick Moo was talking about, where we need, there is some data we do need from the clients and we need endpoints to get that, like a, a histogram, for example, of minor priority fees. Um, but once we have that data, like we can have every wallet can use their own library, they have their own little Oracle, they can tweak it and tune it, we can have standard ones that we share and whatnot. 
and there won't be centralization. Like we don't need to worry about centralization as long as the data is available, even if Geth doesn't provide any uh, gas price estimator. Yeah, I kind of uh, agree that that is a nice approach, just expose the data. One thing I want to still highlight is that uh, the, the basically is exposed already because it's part of the block headers. So, I mean, you can always retrieve the, the base fee of the current block. Uh, I mean, if you just retrieve the header, you have the base fee and you can see whether the block is full or not. So you can, if you must calculate the base fee for the next block, you could, but uh, I don't think anyone wants to estimate that close to the limit. I think some will like it'd be nice if we could have just like the an endpoint that just because in order to calculate the base fee for the next block it is kind of complicated and you do need the full transaction list or you at least need the gas used for the block. Um, if you have the gas used for the block, then yeah, end the base fee from the previous block. It's already there. But the header already contains the gas used. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, so, so yeah, we can that can also be live in the library. So yeah, just the all you need is the last block then and the histogram of historic stuff i think yeah i i tend to agree that like over time i i think because the estimation was like so complicated and now it, it becomes simpler like over time it probably makes sense you know like wallets can probably write some of it themselves um but i i, I guess i do appreciate that like this is like a transition and you want things to kind of be smooth so yeah i i feel like that's probably something like we'll, we'll kind of gradually see happen and um and maybe one thing I don't know I can follow up on is like how do we actually provide like this kind of just base implementation in JavaScript that like you know helps you do a good estimation and shows people that like yeah it's not rocket science and, and we can do it quite quite easily. Um, just because we only have five minutes left though, um, and uh, this is kind of related to the same topic, a few folks asked about having a JSON RPC endpoint for the next blocks base feed. Um, I just wanted to check, I guess, both from the people here and, I don't know, the Get team, like how valuable and, and easy that is, because it is like, it, it is easy to calculate in a way, but it's also like, you know, you do need to like actually look at the spec from 1559. So it feels like it's maybe something that the, the client could, could do pretty easily and that like third party libraries will have to fiddle a lot to, to get working. Um, yeah, so I'm curious what are people's thoughts about like, I don't know, kind of like ETH, GET, base fee for like the next block? That's between the pending block. Like the base oh. For it. Oh, for, oh, already? So you, and it'll basically just look at the, yeah, block gas use and calculate the base fee for the next block? So, um, well, so in order for us to construct the pending block, we need the base fee for the pending block. Oh, yeah. So you can just retrieve the pending block and boom, you have the base fee. Okay, does that work for people here? So you, you get the block with the pending tag and get the base fee per gas from there? That's the answer? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so that would already expose it. I mean, if that's not enough, we can consider exposing it on the API, but kind of, I don't know, isn't that enough? I would be happy to work with Rick Moo to just make sure that ethers.js has a calculate base fee from the pending block, the latest blocks base fee. Um, I think it's simple enough that, you know, just once JavaScript has it, you can just copy that into whatever your language choice is. It shouldn't be too hard. It's already exists in Python. Yeah, I mean, I currently, what I've been doing in, in my current implementation of EIP 1559 is I actually just grab, uh, I get block negative one and take the black the 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 base fee of that. Um, my one concern with is this get pending block is that new or is that something that is that only like 1559? Because part of Ethers is yeah. right now detecting whether or not the network supports um, EIP 1559 by checking the previous block if there is a base fee on it. So so pending has been around for a while. Caveat there, not all clients return the same thing for pending. So for Ethers. I recommend being careful of using that endpoint just because it's not consistent across clients. Right. I mean, I can't even imagine what the other fields would be. So anyways, yes. That's... Yeah, <laughs> neither could the clients and they all imagine something different. <laughs> right, that's fair. So uh, pending block has been part of Ethereum since 
forever. So actually it sinks forever. But but get blocked by hash or get blocked by block tag pending so uh, by number. You are getting number. Uh, you you are receiving block minus one. So that's I mean, that, that's, a, that's an ethers thing. If you pass in a negative number in ethers, it gets the current. It uses the the most recent block number and subtracts it for you. Yeah. So if you get at least in get if you get minus two, that's the pending block. But uh, I don't know if you can actually pass it. So uh, if you just um, Okay, let me just uh, check which endpoint. Okay. Uh, ETH get block, blocked by number, pass pending, the word, the string pending as the one parameter, and you'll get it. Okay, thank you. I'll try that out. It's the same thing as if you had passed late, the word latest in for that, just in the same spot. I think you might need a Boolean as well for whether you want the receipts or the transactions. So the, uh, the only downside I see to to getting the next base fee using the pending block is that you get a lot of unnecessary data, but it works from our use case, so I'm okay with that. Well, um, so if you, I mean, define a lot of unnecessary data. I mean, sure, the base fee is probably five bytes and the header is 500. So yeah, I mean, from that perspective, yes, you do waste a lot of data. The question is, is that too much or isn't it? It's, it's a valid question. So I, I'm i not saying we should not add a gap base fee. I'm just saying that we can do it currently too. So it might be worthwhile to see how people use it and then add the endpoint that's actually needed. Cool. Um, we have two minutes left. Any other quick concern that people had they wanted to bring up? Um, I just had a quick quick comment or, or if I'm not sure what the what the plan is after this, but um, I, 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 was I was struggling to follow along in some parts. And so if someone could give me a summary of uh, like the, it sounded like there are going to be certain phases, there is still a little bit of debate of exactly what the guest client will be providing. And it sounds like also that the a gas station APIs will also be uh, providing some fancy, extra fancy uh, uh, features potentially or not. Um, as a wallet, we would still rather prefer to be able to uh, get information easily and digestibly with like rich content from an API, uh, if that's possible from Geth, but without like, we don't wanna have to constantly be polling uh, on, on each of our clients for the last X number of blocks. Uh, so it'd be great, if, you know, if both were provided from an API standpoint as well as from the clients directly. Um, but yeah, if you could summarize what the phase, like the different phases are for uh, rolling out, that'd be great. Sure. So right now, or <laughs> uh, oh no, sorry, no, it doesn't yeah, have to be right now. It can yeah, just yeah, be like yeah. in a summary after the meeting, just to make sure yeah. that yeah, uh, yeah, we can yeah. understand what's happening. Yeah, and I think you know it's still kind of in flux, but I'll try to to, to get that. Yeah, um, and I'll share it on, on the Discord. Um, yeah. So one thing that uh, before we uh, close speaking up, um, I think Micah mentioned that it would be beneficial for Gap or Ethereum clients in general to expose certain past historical, I don't know, histograms of who's been paying how much or who, which miner. Uh, if we can, so I think providing an ape, um, uh, a gas oracle that works on these is kind of hard. I mean, forget because it's an API that you cannot just change afterwards because if somebody relies on it, you're shooting them in the foot. However, if it's an API that just provides data that others can build upon, that I mean, that can remain stable. So if we just provide an API that returns a histogram of uh, priority fees paid, I mean, at worst, nobody's going to use it, but we don't need to change the API. It cannot be wrong. So I think that might be actually a really good, uh, good idea to expose this information. Then anyone can build a gas oracle on top if they want something custom. And if something turns out to be nice and something turns out to be stable, then we can also ship that within Gap. And the reason I'm saying is that if we can figure out a reasonable data retrieval 
to expose from GAP, then I think it would be nice to add it. But that one kind of needs an idea spec out, because ideally you want to have the same data from both kinds. So Micah, if you have a, a suggestion on what data you would like to see, I think Jolot also had some histogram idea approach. Maybe you can manage uh, the two ideas and yeah, and just to, to keep it quick and tie things up, I th my recommendation is that, uh, like I said, guest returns just some data. The data would be, and some of this is already returned, so I'm just going to try to be all inclusive here. Um, the base fee of the latest block, the base fee of the pending block, the fullness of the latest block, the fullness, I guess, that, yeah, so the, the fullness of the latest block, base fee of the latest block, base fee of the pending block, and then a histogram of the minimum the lowest gas price accepted by over the last n blocks with full blocks filtered out. I think that, that full blocks filtered out, I think, is critical for getting the use, most useful data here. And I think with that, anyone can build a Oracle. Like with that data, you should be able to build most of the types of Oracles I've seen people propose um, with just like a handful of lines of code in any language. Quick idea, along with the histogram of um, gas prices, maybe also histogram of full blocks, if that even makes sense. Or, or so I have like, so there's some way to know yeah. how full blocks are. I think that's definitely useful and interesting data. And I can imagine someone wanting to write an Oracle that takes that into consideration. Like, oh, we've noticed that, you know, there's a lot of volatility and block fullness lately. And so we're gonna change our strategy. And so, yeah, so let's add in, in uh, a stretch goal would be a histogram of block fullness over n blocks. And histogram may be the wrong word. I don't know a better word to use for that pr purpose right now, but. Yeah, I must be get the, yeah, yeah. the idea for the concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it would be super nice if we could just write up a small brain dump of what we would like to see. And then, then we can see what would be, how we could expose the whole thing. Because I guess gathering all that data and exposing it is not particularly complicated. So it's just more like figuring out what the actual data we want to expose is and in what format. Um, Tim, if you give me a place to put stuff, I can start it off and then let people modify from there. Yeah. OK, sure. I'll do that. Uh, I'll send you something. I'll post, I'll post it in the 1559 fee market channel in Discord. Um, if folks want to uh, comment there, uh, yeah, that would be really valuable. So. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't know, put together like a hack MD or something that anyone can edit. Um, yeah. Um, great, well, yeah, this was pretty helpful. Um, and I suspect, you know, we'll probably have another one of these calls in like a few weeks. Uh, and once we actually have 1559 on a test net, it might also make things a bit more concrete. Um, in the meantime, if you do want to just like play in a very experimental way with 1559, we do have a dev net called Calaveras that's up. Um, so that, that's running. There's a, a spec for it uh, in the, the GitHub specs repo. Let me just link it here in the chat if anybody wants to check it out. Um, there's, you know, very basic like RPC support and whatnot, but uh, it allows you to send the transactions. And, and if you have your own tooling to kind of play with them, um, yeah, uh, that, that can be useful. Yeah, that's right. Just to it, uh, if you download GAP's master build, it, it also has a flag for joining with Calaveras Tesla. So you can, with, a, a, with an unstable build of GAP, you can join it and you can play with, with the whole thing. Uh, I actually had a quick question about that as well. Is there like Baikal had somebody else running an RPC node we could just connect to, and it also an explorer? Will there that will that be be added to the new card? Uh, da, 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 da. Calaveras. The explorer is there already. I don't know about the RPC node. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, the explorer is linked in the spec, um, and there's an eat stats and a faucet as well. Uh, oh, okay, last quick question. What's the parameter to sync get with, oh, perfect. It's not with the Calaveras. Yeah, yeah, and they answered in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> cool.
Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and yeah, talk to you all, or at least part of you, in the next in the coming weeks. Thanks, everybody, for joining. We'll send out an email with the link to the recording and notes if there are, or a summary document. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.